Frank, good evening, Anthony. I'm, I'm Margaret Peter Smith, and I'm the chair of the London branch of the Charter Institute of Arbitrators. Uh, it is our enormous good fortune for some years now, I think four years, to have uh, been uh, running this uh, event in coordination uh, with the, we might call the real event, uh, the Frank and British Lawyers Society. Uh, and uh, it's hugely um, uh, looked forward to by members of the branch, and so I'd like to, just to say uh, a couple of words uh, to begin with. Um, no more than a couple of words, because you have uh, a gentleman here who is going to introduce the uh, speakers. Uh, the um, uh, event, as uh, you all know, is uh, the question which seat to choose. Uh, and we, this time, um, it's not just frankly British, we've now expanded our panel to include France, England and Wales, who are helpfully represented here this evening, um, uh, Scotland, ERA and Austria. Uh, and um, what it boils down to is, uh, in the words of the uh, uh, old ad campaign, we never forget you have a choice. And so there, each of them are going to uh, uh, pitch for uh, the countries that uh, they represent, and, and we're looking forward very much to that. Um, chairing the event is going to be uh, David Keane. So David Keane uh, is a retired um, justice of the uh, court appeal of the High Court here. Uh, and, uh, it, it, it is fair to say that having uh, effortlessly moved through very little conflicts uh, with um, uh, an effortless career rising also to uh, being a high court judge in the court of appeal. Uh, but that's what he was uh, before. He is now uh, continuing to be uh, active in the law, um, and so there is a life beyond the court of appeal for him. Uh, and, um, uh, so he, he, in fact, is the Deputy President of the International Commercial Court at uh, Qatar. Um, uh, I uh, knew him uh, when he was uh, still doing such things as Chairman of the Judicial uh, Studies Board, uh, which is what he was at one stage. Uh, and so uh, we have a high part academic uh, to chair this event. Uh, and so um, uh, I brought him. Uh, that, uh, in the words of um, uh, Mrs. Malaprop, uh, comparisons this evening of three of various jurisdictions will be odorous, and we look forward to hearing about them. Thank you, Margaret. So I suppose the question whether there is life in the Court of Appeal, one <laughs> part after it, but there we are. May I add my welcome to you to this joint event uh, of the uh, franco British Lawyers and the uh, Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Uh, I think I can only be asked to chair this particular session because I'm one of those people who have to be members of both organizations. Uh, I can't, of course, think of a better way to spend a rare, sunny summer's evening than at an event like this. I'm sure all of those present will be aware of the importance of the seat of arbitration, usually crucial, of course, in terms of the uh, procedural rules that are to be applied and followed uh, in the arbitration, and also, of course, in deciding uh, which country's courts uh, are to have the supervisory role uh, in respect of the arbitration, and consequently, in many cases, uh, how interventionist uh, the courts are going to be. Uh, but uh, since it's the parties uh, who decide on the seat of arbitration, it's obviously vital that they make well-informed choices. Be London or Paris or New York. We don't have any from New York here this evening, or, or any of a number of other possible seats. And so that is indeed the topic of tonight's debate. We are fortunate to have the service of five very distinguished uh, speakers, highly experienced on these issues. Each of them will say something about the merits of a particular seat. I shall do my best to limit them to no more than ten minutes. Uh, initially each, so there may be time for some comeback and response afterwards, and of course for interventions and questions uh, from the floor. Uh, as you may have gathered, we have, uh, as I go from my left, Ireland, uh, I 
think England, <laughs> Austria, Scotland, and France. Uh, and uh, without wasting any more time, uh, I am going to ask Klaus Wacker uh, to come to the podium, starting with Ireland. As he makes his way there, let me say Klaus is a senior counsel practicing in Dublin and also London, uh, where he's linked with some outfit called Bridgeport Chambers. Uh, he's uh, acted either as an arbitrator or as counsel in arbitrations in over a hundred international arbitrations, and he's published numerous articles. Yeah. First question is to this as well. Okay, I'll have to speak up then. Um, I'd like to thank the branch and the society for their very kind invitation. I particularly like to single out uh, my improbably impressed neighbour next door uh, and my dear Irish friend, Mr. Louis Flannery, who got probably the same invitation. Uh, a couple of basic points. Uh, I got an email yesterday from Louis to say, please come in national dress. And I applied my mind a great deal as to what that meant. Louis suggested that we wear a hat in the shape of a pint of Guinness. Now, I thought a great deal about that. And I thought about the fact that actually no native-born Irish person will ever wear such a hat. The only people who wear such hats are tourists to Ireland on St. Patrick's Day, or people who go to Ireland for the Six Nations. I think no native Irish-born person would ever be seen dead in such a hat. So that's not a native dress. Um, similarly, uh, and I, I was quite struck by the, the program here where it referred to Ireland as era. Nobody in Ireland actually refers to Ireland as era. It's only English people who refer to Ireland as era, and it's a source of immense amusement to us in Ireland uh, that the only place in the world where our language, where our country is referred to in the native language is in England, but it's rich with irony. Final sort of little bit of exposition about Ireland I'd like to make is there are virtually no Irish speakers in reality in Ireland, and the only Irish speaker that I know who speaks Irish on a day-to-day -day basis in his family is a chap who was born here and went to Eton and then rediscovered his grandparents' roots, went back to Ireland and learned Irish. <laughs> now, putting all that to one side, I'm here to speak about Dublin as a venue. And uh, what is it that Dublin has to offer by way of its arbitration law? Um, for many, many years, and practically for about 300 years since the effectively the common law took root throughout the entirety of the island of Ireland, um, Irish arbitration law pretty much tracked that of here in England. Um, and the various statutes were broadly the same. And in 1998, the first of what I would describe as two deep swings away from the English approach to arbitration, when the uh, Irish Parliament passed an act to implement the 1985 version of the model law as our international arbitration act. Um, we still retained a domestic arbitration regime which broadly coincided with the 1950 arbitration act. So in the main, most of the arbitration in Ireland uh, was subject to this old law and case stated and all that other sort of ghastly nonsense. 2010, <coughs> enormous change. Um, a clean break of the past, and the Irish Parliament passed an entirely new Arbitration Act, which implemented in almost unchanged fashion the uh, 2006 version of the Model Law. All the Article 17 stuff, all the interim measures, the lot, the whole thing is now our Arbitration Act. So, in a nutshell, if you know the 2006 Model Law, you know Ireland's Arbitration Act. That covers everything. And the changes are very, very few indeed. And I'll just identify a couple of points for you. We've in the model law, you have a default number of arbitrators at three. 
we decided to put the default number at one. That was more in keeping with the tradition um, in Ireland. And also, uh, we've all heard all the background noise about costs and arbitration, and people were shouting and roaring about costs and arbitration. Um, on a quick aside, I wondered if they actually know what they're talking about, or have actually ever done the case. And I would swiftly move on. So we decided civil arbitration was position. Um, one particular thing that we have really set out to do was to make court applications under the model law, whether it's a set-aside application under Article 34 or any other application of any kind whatsoever, subject to one round of hearings in the High Court. There is no further appellate procedure up. You get one shot at it, and that is that. No appeals of any kind. And that was particularly inspired by the Swiss approach. And um, as part of the debate which led to the, um, the enactment of the 2010 Arbitration Act, there was extensive consultation within the Irish arbitration community, but also within many of the people internationally who had come to Ireland for ICA in 2008. And there was a lot of outreach from the community and from the Attorney General and the Attorney General's office to people who had come to Ireland. And the thing that really resonated with the Irish government was the Swiss approach. You go to the federal tribunal, if you fail there, well then that's it, tough luck. And that's the approach we have in Ireland. You go to the High Court, and if you fail there, you can't go up uh, along the appellate line. So it may be, it, that's quite a change from the past. But what it does do, and we took also some soundings in the United States about this, it provides a certainty to parties as to the amount of time the post-award procedures will take. Because there is now a dedicated number of judges in the Irish court system who are assigned under the Arbitration Act. And there is a very specific court procedure set out in our civil procedure rules for the very timely filing of affidavits, and there's no room for give on this. You're either file your affidavit in time or tough luck. That's the way it works. And the one of the more recent examples that I could find is that from the filing of the first affidavits to the hearing and disposition of a contested matter under the 2010 Arbitration Act, was 16 days, and that was it. And the, the, uh, an awful lot of resources has, have been climbed into the Irish court system to get away from the delays that were inherent in commercial matters in the past. And that is one of the things that we have been particularly pushing um, internationally as uh, an aspect of Irish arbitration law. Um, one of the things we've also done as a seat is we as a community in Ireland through the Irish Arbitration Association is critically analyze for ourselves who is going to be the target market. We know we cannot be London. We know we cannot be Paris. We cannot be Geneva. We can't be one of the big centers. We were never going to do that and any pretense uh, uh, to say that we would suddenly emerge onto the market and be the biggest player was simply uh, cloud cuckoo land. So what we did was we decided that we would focus our efforts principally on the very best market that we could find and the most receptive market. The most receptive market of them all for anything to do with Ireland is the United States. And with the assistance of the Irish government, the Irish um, Foreign Office, uh, the um, Irish Business Development Boards abroad, what we've done is we have identified as many people in the Irish diaspora in business and in law in the United States, and we have quite unashamedly gone after them, told them of this service, and we are now getting quite some significant traction in uh, that market because we know that is the one that we potentially have a find the most favor. But we're not going to do roadshows in Moscow because we all know that 
the Russian market favors London above all else. And we are not in the business of nakedly going after a friend's marketplace. That's not the way we do it. We view ourselves as a significantly good alternative for the American market. <coughs> uh, perhaps a key point, and I've taken some soundings from a client on the choice of a venue. And a client mine has a fairly complex international business with 19 joint venture agreements dotted around the world, and quite a few in sub-Saharan Africa. And I asked their, uh, not their in-house counsel, because I'd get a lawyer's response. I asked uh, one of the section business managers, because they ultimately control in quite a granular way their contracts. Um, what would they look for in a seat? Um, or uh, an arbitration, and every single one of their joint venture agreements has ICC and Paris. That's their standard uh, position. And I asked them, what would they look for if they were going to change that? And would they look at a certain other venues? Uh, they went away, they thought about it, and I, they came back, and I thought they were going to say stuff about you know, a good law and a modern law and all that other sort of lawyer's palaver. What a bit of it. The one thing they came back, they said, okay, take all the law, make, that's, assume that that is right, and we'll only go to places that are, have a fairly good law about it, and that's, that's easy to point out because there's so many places in the world who say they have a good law. When you examine it, they probably do. What they wanted was the certainty that in a seat, if something went wrong and they had to go to the local courts, there were sufficient numbers of law firms and lawyers that they could choose from to re represent them in the local courts. They did not want to go to a place where there were a small number of lawyers or there was a very tightly knit legal community. They wanted to go to a place with a lot of competition in the market. This was very much a businessman's approach to the choice of arbitration. And what we have done in Ireland is we have taken that uh, admonition and we have been very careful in our promotion activities in the United States to tell people of the diversity of firms and the competition amongst firms and the number of firms in Dublin and the number of barristers in Dublin who will be able to undertake this work for international clients. If you think about the London market, somebody comes in, they choose London. There are literally 50 or 100 firms you could go to, hundreds of barristers you could choose from. But if you go to a community, perhaps, where there are very few firms, or interlinked firms, um, what my client said to me quite clearly was, if we go to X jurisdiction, and he mentioned the jurisdiction specifically because they had made a direct approach to them, if we go to that jurisdiction, we are going to have to have Mr. X on permanent retainer forever because we've already identified that Mr. X is the key player in this market. He's the person who's best friend with the judges. And we are, simply do not want to have the risk that one of our competitors in an arbitration would have that person. And they will not, under any circumstances, be held hostage by one lawyer because of the choice of seat. <coughs> That's a pragmatic approach to the choice of seat, and I commend it to you, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Klaus. We're going to move on now to uh, the merits of London. Uh, Louis Flannery is a partner in uh, Stevenson Harwood, head of international arbitration. Yeah? No doubt very well known to many in this room. He's a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and the author or editor of some of the leading works on arbitration, uh, which he has obviously brought along this evening. Uh, he's a uh, very experienced this advocate, and you'll not be uh, surprised that he's going to speak about the virtues of London as the scene. Is this is Can everybody hear me? Right, is this not working? Yeah, it's working. Does it? 
Take it off here. Is that work? Mm -hmm. no, nobody hear me now. Good. Klaus, 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 Klaus. You mean I'm moving off camera? Stay here. <laughs> Do not move. It's a Germanic fashion. Yeah. Right. Klaus, right. Right. Klaus Reichardt gives rise to a question I want to ask everybody. There are about 50 or 60 of you. Put your hand up if you can honestly say that all four of your grandparents were born in England. Okay? All four of your grandparents, for certain, were born in England. Oh, first up. You had to say yes, didn't you? Yorkshireman flew and through. <laughs> One, two, three. Am I really? Three. three. Four. Four. Five, four. Six, five. John, you let me down. <laughs> Are you sure? Absolutely. Are you sure as well? That all of mine were born here? Yeah. Yes. No, not Wales, not Scotland? No, no, in England. In England? Yes. You sound English, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you must know why, but I can't put my hand up to that question. I can't notice it. Uh, nor can he. And nor can obviously the vast majority of you. So what, six of you put your hands up to say all four of your records. A small percentage. But significant because um, the vast majority of people here are as international as London is international for uh, purposes of arbitration. Now, you're all here. I'm not, I'm not don't, don't, don't worry, come in, thank you. Just question, were all four of your grandparents born out uh, in England? Yes or no? No. <laughs> Just checking. All right. So they're not skewing the statistics. Right. So we know that we're all here as an international crowd, and we are all in London. Klaus, despite having the most dramatic name you could imagine, is a Jerry from Kerry. He's a full-on Irishman. What were you born in Ireland? Yeah. Yeah, there we are. Born in Ireland. Right. I was outside the pay. Uh, I, I was. Now, okay, I, you may think I'm inappropriately dressed. No, you're all inappropriately dressed. Look at the weather <laughs> outside. I'm the only one who's appropriately dressed. Uh, what was I going to say? Right, advances of London. The London, uh, London is the home to the London Court of International Arbitration. London is the home to the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. London is the home of the IDRC on Fleet Street, which handles about 600 arbitrations a year. The LCIA handles about 300. London is a hub for travel. The world's busiest airport, Heathrow, the world's busiest airport is London, 130 million passengers a year. That's four per second passing through London, outstripping anywhere in the world. English, the most commonly spoken language in the world, if you ignore Mandarin. Are there any Mandarin speakers? You see, I make my point. <laughs> any English speakers? <laughs> Everybody speaks English. Um, the choice of London as a seat would naturally follow if one party were, for example, uh, Russian, and the other party were, for example, American. Even Klaus was good enough to concede that Dublin isn't trying to chase that kind of market uh, because it couldn't hope to compete with London, or for that matter, Paris. But even then, all the statistics over the last 10 years have shown uh, that um, people know that correctly. But London outstrips Paris in terms of the number of arbitrations. Um, and I would su suggest that it follows because uh, English is so commonly chosen as uh, the appropriate law for a contract. Um, in terms of um, the supervisory courts, Klaus was saying that, uh, if I understood correctly, if for any reason you needed to go to the supervisory courts, you only get one shot, right? 
Now, if you'd only got one shot in Fiona Trust, we wouldn't have had Fiona Trust. Very few people know that Tom Morrison at first instance went the other way in Fiona Trust. Fiona Trust, for anybody who doesn't know, was a case that effectively rewrote the English law on the interpretation of arbitration agreements and gave the widest possible interpretation uh, to an arbitration agreement to encompass any disputes. The, the, the position in Fiona Trust was that the um, ship owners were alleging that the contracts were void because of uh, bribery, uh, alleged bribery. I can say alleged bribery, I can in fact say there was no bribery because my client was bribery. Uh, alleged bribery. <laughs> there was no bribery. Anyway, the owner trust would not have happened had it not gone to appeal. Um, Jivraj. Anybody um, not heard of Jivraj? A recent case where first instance in Court of Appeal, with respect to state of maintenance, but all was corrected finally in the Supreme Court. Um, can't say the same, I will be honest with you. Um, that will kind of start where even the Supreme Court might have not quite got that But subject to that one single aberration since 1996 when the Arbitration Act was introduced, um, the appellate jurisdiction in this country has generally speaking, in my view, got it right. Um, no doubt. He will correct me. Um, what else have we got? Um, we have a right of appeal on a point of law, which a lot of people in other jurisdictions say that's anti-arbitration. Um, my response to that is it's nonsense. First of all, you cannot doubt of the right of appeal on a point of law. If you, in your arbitration agreement, adopt the ICC rules or the LCIA rules, you exclude your right of appeal on the point of law, so the actual tribunal has the final say on any issue of law. Number two, the, the, right of law, the right of appeal on the point of law only exists for English law and not for any foreign law. Even if the foreign law, which in one case was Indian law, was regarded and treated by the tribunal as identical to English law, there's still no right of appeal. So the right of appeal is limited. Number three, the number of successful cases under section 69, where uh, an appeal has been allowed, about 5% of the total. The most recent of which, okay, hands up who knows what a spoonerism is. I'm going to talk about West Tankers now. West Tankers was a case where the judge at first instance, um, a long time ago, Sir Anthony Coleman, Mr. Justice Coleman, gave an antecedent injunction which was regarded ultimately by the European Court of Justice as wrong, and uh, uh, the injunction had to be uh, lifted. Um, the matter came back very recently because um, having allowed the other party to proceed in the courts of Italy implicitly, the question was whether the Arbitral Tribunal could allow, uh, or, or whether the Arbitral Tribunal had jurisdiction to allow credit damages, and um, the tribunal said, no, we don't have jurisdiction, except for one brave dissenter who said, yes, we do. Uh, he, uh, the matter was appealed, uh, and the judge at first instance, under appeal section 69, said the tribunal did, did have jurisdiction uh, to award damages for which the arbitration was. It's a big case, and it will carry on rolling for a number of years because the appeal is about to be uh, um, well, listed for by understand early next year. But it's an example of, I think, a positive application of the right of appeal on a point of law being uh, in, under English law, because the result, whichever way it goes, will be um, another piece in the jigsaw of English jurisprudence on uh, arbitration law, which is another reason why, uh, in my view, this is uh, a wonderful jurisdiction to, to have the arbitration in, and it's because the law is so well developed uh, West Tankers will add another um, little tile to that mosaic. Um, what else did I have to say? I, I admitted Dallas was bad. My last point, and I will admit this, London is expensive. 
when you compare our rates with the rest of Europe. I accept that. But one offset point, or two offset points, number one, more and more we're finding that third party funding, conditional fees, contingency fees is coming in to alleviate that. Uh, and uh, number two, the LCIA is the only institution uh, in, the, in the world, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but at least all of the others in Paris, Geneva, Stockholm, uh, Hong Kong, Dubai, Singapore, charge uh, the parties by what is called an ad valorem basis, according to the amount of dispute. Uh, which means if you have an extremely large amount of money in dispute, you can reach up to several million dollars in the fees of the arbitrators, regardless of the amount of work that's carried out. The statistics show that for very large disputes, the fees of the LCIA, where the arbitrators are charged per hour, are uh, dwarfed by those of the ICC uh, and, and other institutions. On the contrary, for smaller scale disputes, I will accept that the ICC and uh, the other ethical institutes, institutes uh, generally charge less. And there is obviously a middle ground where it's a bit grey, depends on the amount of dispute. Certainly for the larger scale disputes, LCIA uh, in London turns out to be cheaper. Um, and that's the last point to make, is this. Arbitrators around the world tend to regard London as um, a, a place to arbitrate. It tends to be, as it were, uh, a bit of a Hollywood for the arbitration superstars. Um, I'm sure that the other places will decline to say that they're the pioneers of the, of the uh, arbitral world. But, but London just happens to be the place where a lot of people get to very easily from very far jurisdictions. Um, that's all I have to say until I'm answering questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're going to move on now to Christian Conrad. Uh, Dr. Conrad has a PhD in law from Vienna. He is a member of the Vienna Bar, as well as being a solicitor in, in this country. He was counsel with the Freshfield Brookhouse Derringer in their arbitration group, uh, but since then uh, has been the founding partner of his own firm of attorneys. He has an enormous amount of experience in international arbitrations. I believe he's going to tell us something about Vienna as a seat. Thank you so much, and thank you. Um, for this kind invitation that I can sort of uphold the Austrian flag here this evening. Um, I would like to start the presentation with a rather heretic question, whether the choice of the seat of the arbitration is really that important. Um, it is considered, as we can see in all academic writing, as being the vital territorial link uh, between the proceedings and the law of place um, where these proceedings are legally situated. But that is the reason why it's commonly referred to as the formal legal domicile of the arbitration. And this territorial approach has been widely accepted in international doctrine for many, many years. However, uh, I must say that in more recent times, there is an effort, um, conceivable, to detach and thus delocalize um, the international arbitration as much as possible from the seat of the arbitration. And I think rightfully so. This trend um, has been reflected in modern arbitral legislation. You can uh, find that, for example, in the new Austrian uh, Code of Civil Procedure. Um, and you can see the tendency in particular where the modern arbitration law tries to limit um, the, um, the, inf the interference by the domestic courts, uh, in particular to the arbitration process as such, commonly referred to as an arbitration-friendly minimum. And of course, ultimately, there's a choice to make. Each state will have to determine uh, whether, when it decides which law it will adopt to govern the arbitration proceeding. Um, when they're seated in its own territory, they will define the scope of the Lex Arbitri. And even though we can say the, the arbitration law should not have that major influence, there is still an influence, because we all are aware of Article 5, um, Paragraph 1, Literal D, which clearly refers that recognition and enforcement uh, can be refused if the award uh, was not rendered in accordance with the law of the country where the arbitration took place. 
So if you look at the at the Lex Load CRB tree, as I would refer to it, and, and what sort of relevance it really has, I would, I would uh, extend to you three different categories that I have identified. The first one, of course, it will always have a certain effect on which rules govern the arbitration agreement. And this may include the conflict of law rules as to what applies to the agreement as such. It may also be the question of the capability to enter into the arbitration agreement, the arbitrability of disputes, um, the validity, the effect of the arbitration agreement, and all that such. Second, the Lex Loki arbitrity, it, it also addresses procedural issues, as we have heard already, um, all the questions that safeguard the process, the right to be heard, etc., in the influence of the domestic courts. I would like to highlight at that stage, third and finally, that the whole state may, through its conflict of law rules, also interfere uh, in the substance of the dispute. So that might also play um, a role when you go and look out for a suitable venue for your proceedings. Um, talking about Austria, the Austrian arbitration law has in principle adopted this concept of territoriality by linking the applicability of its arbitration law to the seat of the arbitration. That is not a surprise. The term of the seat of the arbitration as such is not defined, so it can therefore be inferred by statute that this is a purely legal meaning, it is a fictional seat, and of course, uh, actions of the arbitration can take place anywhere else. But yet, in line with the modern trend, the Austrian territorial approach is self-restraint. It is an overriding feature of this new Austrian arbitration law, which was enacted in 2006, that it forced the parties to significant freedom to customize their proceedings according to their own designs and needs. And at the same time, the new Austrian arbitration law limits the intervention by the state courts, as I said, to a very few pre-specified inst instances. So conceptually, the Austrian legislature self-imposed restrictions. They recognize uh, very well as a separate and independent form of dispute resolution and a principle which is protected from the national interference. So ultimately, the question of which seat to choose is as we already heard in reality, a question of expectation management as I see it. So what can the parties expect when they are arbitrating their dispute in a certain jurisdiction? And what can you expect when you are arbitrating your dispute in Austria? Um, the Austrian arbitration law was completely revised in 2006. It had a very solid foundation uh, dating back to 1898 which should give you a good feeling about the well-established jurisprudence um, and judges well aware of the importance of arbitration. Um, and having said that, the Austrian Arbitration Act is based on the Constitutional Model Law, and that's it. It was precisely for that reason why Austria has adopted the Constitutional Model Law to distinguish any further discussion what sort of leaves or begs the question whether there are any further questions to be asked there or not. We, we looked very carefully into other jurisdictions, in particular to our neighbors uh, in Germany, and I think we sorted out what the problems they had, and we didn't repeat them. So I can say that the Austrian arbitration laws from 2006 um, is, a, is a good example of what you can achieve when you look into uh, the line of making international arbitration also in a domestic setting. I must say, though, that there is currently one reform on its way, uh, which fits nicely into what Klaus said today, uh, that is that um, the Austrian arbitration law is currently under consideration to shorten the instances and setting aside proceedings according to the Swiss model and making it just a one instance proceedings. In addition to that, uh, you might encounter what I refer to arbitration-friendly courts. Um, here begs the question, what is actually arbitration friendly? I think that's always a question from, uh, from the, uh, which spectator you're looking from. The winning party, of course, would not like to see a court that is interventionist, that takes too long in setting aside proceedings. The losing party, of course, would very much like to see that to happen. Um, but I can say from the, from the uh, material that I found that um, we had in 2009 only nine setting aside claims in Vienna. In 2010, only four. And we had six in 2011. 
So whatever that sort of gives you the feeling um, um, uh, whether sort of the domestic ports are involved or not. What you will also find um, in Austria is uh, an arbitral institution, uh, which you might know is the Vienna International Arbitral Center. Um, it was founded in 1975, um, and according to its own uh, saying and history, um, it's very much uh, developed for east-west um, disputes uh, for the former Comic Con countries because that's what it's designed to, to be. Um, I brought some, some figures from the statistics with me. Um, the, uh, the statistics are from 2011 and the, the, the average cases that the Vienna International Laboratory Center receives every year is around 80. And at the, at the moment, the number of pending cases are 83 with an aggregated amount of these of roughly 700 million euros. Um, the country of the origin of the parties is, is not surprisingly, most, mostly it's Austrian, Germans, and Italian, but then we have the Slovak Republic, Poland, Hungary, Romania, so all the surrounding countries, Czech Republic, a few Russians, a few Swiss, all the single English party I can see there. Um, so I think at the end, uh, it really comes down to the question of predictability. Uh, to pick up on Klaus's points, there are, um, I, the last time I looked it up, more than 3,000 lawyers uh, admitted to the bar in Vienna. So there is a vivid local community and a variety that you can choose from. Um, and there is a sound and legal uh, framework uh, which would allow you to choose Vienna as a seat of, of your arbitration. In case I could not convince you uh, with that legal talking, uh, maybe there are some other reasons that I would like to bring forward why Vienna would be uh, your preferred choice. Um, undoubtedly, whether you like it or not, Vienna is the capital of classical music. And um, the soothing effect of classical music on the troubled mind is very well known to everyone. Um, you also know that, you might know that Vienna um, hosts over 300 balls every year. So uh, that might be the reason why most of the arbitrators' deliberations that, that I'm involved in usually take place in January or beginning of February. Um, you also uh, know that the arbitration world is a world of very colorful animals. Um, and therefore you might want to stroll around in the world's oldest zoo, which was built in 1752 in the castle of Schönbrunn. But for me, actually, the most compelling argument why Vienna would be uh, your preferred choice uh, for the seat of an arbitration is that Vienna is considered to be the birth birthplace of psychotherapy. <laughs> and, uh, and after, after a successful arbitration hearing, uh, when you then revisit the Siegfried, Sigmund Freud Museum in the Ninth District, you will actually find out that the, the reason for the dispute is not the question of contractual interpretation, but it's a hidden conflict that you had with your mother. With your mother <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian. I can see that this is going to descend into a, uh, a tourist promotion exercise. <laughs> Our next speaker was asked to wear his kilt, but somehow we got to do so. Uh, Brandon Malone is a <coughs> solicitor advocate uh, and a partner in McClure Naismith. He's uh, chairman of the Scottish Arbitration Centre and also a visiting lecturer at the Universities of Edinburgh at Strathclyde and Dundee. Amongst his many articles and many published papers is one which is entitled Why Arbitrate in Scotland? No doubt tell us that now, Brandon. <laughs> Uh, is this microphone working? Can you hear me? Uh, good. Right. Well, I'm not quite sure how I follow Zoo, uh, Christian. Uh, I don't have a Zoo to offer you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honoured and delighted to have been asked to represent uh, Scotland this evening. Um, I'm intrigued. I was intrigued to learn this evening that the, the French are being represented by an Englishman, uh, the English by an Irishman, uh, the Irishman by a German. Is <laughs> uh, uh, I, I think my name sounds slightly more Irish than his, but that's okay. I'm being Irish. Um, it would uh, perhaps be too easy to, to play to national stereotypes, um, but given that um, despite all four of my grandparents being born in Scotland, I am. 
partly Greek, so I think I would probably come out <laughs> worse if I went down that path. So I'm not going to do that. Um, but going with the general pattern of representation by proxy that we have this evening, I'm going to turn to someone who's absent from this evening, somewhat ironically absent from this meeting uh, of the Franco British Law Society, the Frenchman up here. Uh, so I'm going to bring a Frenchman to the party. I'm going to bring Francois Marie Allais, better known as uh, Voltaire, the great Enlightenment thinker who famously said, Nous tomons vers la cause pour trouver toutes nos idées sur la civilisation. Which, for those of you who don't speak French, and probably for those of you who do speak French, <laughs> uh, uh, means we look to Scotland to find all of our ideas of civilization. Uh, now, what can we take from this French praise? I take two things from this. First, we can be pretty sure that Voltaire never went to Glasgow. <laughs> so, in any Glasgow, I've lost all the Scottish members of the audience. Uh, secondly, uh, I take from this that uh, in 250 years ago, Scotland was a, a shining beacon punching above its weight, uh, leading the way in international thought. Uh, so, once again today, I, I say to you that Scotland is a, a shining beacon leading the way. Uh, and so, what's the difference about arbitration in Scotland? Well, first, First, I want to tell you uh, about uh, what is the same about arbitration in Scotland. Uh, the law, we have a new Arbitration Act in Scotland, Arbitration Scotland Act 2010. Uh, it's more law compliant. It's very similar uh, to the English Act, or the English and Welsh and Irish Act of 1996. So similar that one of our arbitration judges, uh, Lord Glenny uh, himself, uh, with a background as an English uh, maritime arbitration QC, observed since the Scottish Act was closely and unashamedly modelled on the English Act and reflects the same underlying philosophy, authorities on that Act and its predecessor, the Arbitration Act 1979, in relation to questions of interpretation and approach, will obviously be relevant. There is no point in reinventing the arbitration wheel. So although we have a brand new Arbitration Act, it is predictable in its operation. The courts in Scotland are able to use English case law where useful, uh, but to depart from it where necessary. Uh, so between the Usutra and the English Act, uh, the law in Scotland is basically the same as you would encounter in most of the arbitration centres around the world. Well, what about the rules? Well, the rules, what rules can you use in Scotland? Well, the Act is, is a self-contained set of rules, uh, but it is open to you to use any rules you like, of course, uh, whether that's ICC or LCIA or ICDR or uh, the Vienna rules or CTAG. All you have to do is specify that Scotland is the seat of arbitration. So the rules are basically the same and can that be identical. And what about the lawyers? We've heard about lawyers. Well, the lawyers are the same. If you're arbitrating under English law in Scotland, you'll be using English lawyers. If you're arbitrating under French law, uh, you'll be using French lawyers, without, and so on and so forth. You would go with the substantive uh, law of the contract, uh, unless, of course, you have to go to court for whatever reason, and then you want to instruct local lawyers. Now we have plenty of those, some would say, are too many. Now, there's no uh, requirement, uh, I should make that clear, there is no requirement to be a Scottish qualified lawyer to conduct an arbitration in Scotland. We are an open jurisdiction, and that applies, of course, equally to arbitrators. And what about the arbitrators? Well, again, uh, the arbitrators are the same international arbitrators as you would use in any other arbitration, whether they're appointed by the ICC, the LCIA, uh, whoever the case may be. It's the same people you're going to come across. Um, but of course, we can provide you with arbitrators if you like. Uh, the Scottish Arbitration Centre, which I chair, has an independent uh, appointments committee, uh, so we can make ad hoc appointments. Uh, they are distributed globally, and they will take a view uh, without any influence uh, or parochial view from Scotland. We don't maintain a panel, uh, they have an entirely free hand. Uh, so what I'm saying to you about arbitration in Scotland is that it's basically the same, uh, but in a good way. Uh, the law is basically the same, the rules are basically the same, the lawyers are basically the same, the arbitrators are the same, the language, that's all right. More or less, more or less. You've understood this so far, I think, unless you're laughing at me rather than with me. Um, so we have the rule of law, we have the New York Convention, etc., etc., etc. It's a safe arbitration environment, one which you uh, and your clients will find uh, familiar. So that's what's familiar, similar, what's different? There's a few differences uh, in particular I'd like to mention. Uh, the first is our confidentiality provision. If you choose to use our rules, uh, the, we have a provision which makes breach of confidentiality actionable. Um, so that's to say, if the breach causes loss, that loss can be recovered in court, and that extends to a breach by the arbitrator. So that's quite innovative. Um, 
But, uh, okay, you have confidentiality in a number of jurisdictions. To an extent, it's a bit of a dead letter because you end up in court and, and uh, parties come out, etc., etc. But we've, we've thought about that, and what we have is a provision which means that if you do end up in court on, for example, the jurisdiction challenge, uh, proceedings are anonymized so as to retain confidentiality. And that's not just the party's names being anonymized. Um, the actual content of the decision will be anonymized so that, so far as possible, the identity of the parties, the, the subject matter of the case, is not disclosed more than to the extent which is necessary to establish the legal principle. And indeed, in one case, that we had the same Judge Lodge Glenny offering to show an opinion and draft to the parties so they could have a look at it and to decide whether there was going to be confidential information disclosed. So that's innovative, I would say, innovative. Um, we also have a system of arbitral appointment referees so that if there's a failure in the appointments process, you don't have to go off to court uh, and all the expense uh, delay that entails to try and get an arbitral appointed. Uh, that works um, in a similar way to the adjudicator nominating bodies. If any of you do construction law, well, you can go directly to one of these bodies and they will give you an arbitrator. Um, we have flexibility in our act. Uh, if global arbitration practice changes, uh, there are, or if there are changes to the, the modern law or the New York Convention, uh, that can be changed by ministerial order. There is no need for amending primary legislation. Um, and we have the Scottish legal tradition, which has been characterized by our honorary president, Sir David Edward QC, former judge of the European Court, as one of common sense. If we don't have full-blown discovery procedures with all the delay and expense as entails, we have a hybrid system, civil common law system, which will feel familiar to lawyers from around the world. Uh, we have a very restricted appeal process. Uh, we don't have an error of law appeals unless you use Scots law in your contract, which um, I don't expect many of you will, but uh, if you choose to do that, there is a legal error appeal. Um, but even then, appeals can be excluded. If you use a different legal system, there's no legal error appeal, and all you have is the same mechanism as you have uh, in England and Wales, the serious irregularity challenge, the uh, jurisdiction challenges. Uh, that goes to uh, one judge, a single judge, in the outer house of the court session. There is an appeal from there. I think it's important to have an appeal because one judge can always get it wrong. Uh, but that is a, a filtered appeal. It's not an automatic right of appeal. Uh, and there is a, a requirement to get past uh, ensuring that the, the appeal is a good appeal, an important question that deserves to be heard. Uh, there is no threat to the Supreme Court. Uh, I think two bites of the cherry probably hits about the right balance. Um, so, for all of these reasons individually taken together, uh, Scotland is a much cheaper place to arbitrate. Um, and cost, I would say, for Scotland is a major distinguishing factor. And the final distinguishing factor is Scotland itself, uh, the place, the culture, and the people. We have Edinburgh, uh, Scotland's ancient capital. We have the splendor of the Highlands. Uh, we have Glasgow. We have. <laughs> I'm not from Glasgow. I mean, yeah, I mean, I that. Uh, we have uh, seafood, uh, salmon, or beef. We have the natural larder that was the envy of the world. We have the whiskey. We have the golf. Uh, we have the venues. We've got some of the best hotels in the world. The Eagles. We have Lord Bowman, St Andrews, Troon. Uh, I am on permission from visit Scotland. Uh, we have culture. Uh, we're the home of the world's leading arts festival, the Edinburgh International Festival, and one of the world's. Uh, all the film festivals in the Edinburgh International Film Festival, which starts on the 20th of June. <laughs> um, so Scotland is an ancient European nation, and yet in many ways it is a, a young country, uh, and after centuries of, of, of losing its identity within the United Kingdom, uh, it's starting to emerge back onto the world stage in a number of areas, and arbitration is one of those areas. Uh, so is Scotland the seat to choose? Uh, I say it is. But I'll leave the, the last word to uh, a great philosopher of the Scottish Enlightenment, uh, the great David Hume, who said, the truth springs from arguments amongst friends. So friends, let's argue <laughs>
Good evening, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and a privilege for me to represent the colours of Paris as a place of arbitration. Um, I grew up in London. I'm half Irish, half English. They're my origins. And I've been practicing out of Paris now for over 15 years in arbitration. But I'm just one of many non-French um, arbitration practitioners who've been based in Paris um, and use Paris as a base. Um, and I can confirm firsthand that there is a real multinational, culturally diverse pool of legal practitioners in Paris, active in arbitration, and across a broad range of industries and sectors. And that raises one obvious question, which is what draws such a diverse range of legal practitioners to the City of Lights? And that raises another inherent question, which is, and a more important one, as far as I'm concerned, which is why do our clients from around the world choose Paris and continue to do so? These are the end users of the arbitration process. I'm going to divide um, this uh, very brief talk into just three parts. The first is just to give you a brief outline of the legal framework and the level of judicial support that has historically been vital to developing Paris as um, a hub in international arbitration. Then just to take into account a few pragmatic, practical considerations. And then finally, um, in the way Klaus had um, got some soundings from clients, I've done that over the last few weeks. And I'm just going to share with you a few observations that have been harnessed from informal chats with a few clients who have been doing arbitrations in Paris. So start by looking a little bit at the legal framework. Well, just over one year ago, um, there was a new French law on arbitration that came into force. That was on the 1st of May 2011. It was the result of co cooperation between arbitration professionals and the French Ministry of Justice. Every um, person this evening who's spoken so far has explained how their laws are based on the model law. Well, the French like to be different, and they deliberately did not base this new law on the model law. It's not a revolution, but a revolution isn't needed in France. All that the new law does is effectively encapsulates 30 years of consistent um, and developed case law into a code. And that was something that was a bit of a novelty to me when I first arrived in France with my common law tunnel vision, um, in that in the arbitration field, you had to go back and look at precedents, not in the French code, in order to work out what some of the key arbitration rules were because it wasn't codified. That now has been changed with this new law, and thanks to this new law. Its primary preoccupation is to achieve a clear and simple um, drafting style, and that was deliberately to foster a better understanding for foreign legal professionals and for foreign users. Paris wants to attract and continue to attract people from around the globe to use Paris. Um, I'm not obviously going to go through all of the provisions of that new law, but what I am going to do is just highlight a few of the key features and some of the innovations. And they, I think, show very well that France remains at the forefront as a pro-arbitration jurisdiction. <clears throat> it's a truism that arbitration is only really as good as the enforceability of the award. I think everybody in this room can see that. It's a truism that France has taken very much to heart. Prior to the new law, the enforcement of arbitral awards was automatically suspended when there was an action to set aside or there was a challenge to it, the enforcement that was introduced. That obstacle to enforcement has been removed by the new law, and that provides that awards rendered in France are immediately enforceable unless a, the party challenging the award demonstrates that its rights would be severely prejudiced as a result of the provision of enforcement, and that is a very high threshold to achieve. The aim of that new provision is to discourage frivolous applications for anonymous awards, and there were, over the years, a number of dilatory tactics that were being used to delay the enforcement of valid arbitral awards. It's worth noting here, too, that French law is generally more generous um, than a number of other jurisdictions, and even more generous than the New York Convention, when it comes to the recognition and enforcement of foreign arbitral awards. French law is unique or rather unique, in that even if an award is issued, an award that is issued abroad has been annulled by the courts of the place of arbitration, that fact of itself does not constitute a basis for denying the recognition and enforcement of the award in France. 
one last word on the enforcement, and that is that the procedure has been simplified by the new law. And we've recently been involved in getting um, an enforcement order. It took 10 days. It's rapid, it's ex parte, and it costs very little for our clients. Another innovation was the, in the new law was the ability of parties to an arbitration in France to agree to waive any action to set aside the award. So we're talking about the non-judge action. It must be specific, it will never be um, implied. But if that waiver is made, the only avenue to challenge an award in France is to appeal against the orders for enforcement of the award. French law hasn't been insular in its approach in developing this new law. It didn't adopt the, the modern law, but it did look at that. But it decided that it would look at other jurisdictions. It looked to England, it looked to Switzerland, it looked to Belgium. The ability for parties to waive any action to set aside was inspired by existing foreign law, and that was Swiss and Belgian law. Um, inspired, but it wasn't adopted wholesale. It was adapted. Um, Swiss and Belgian law, I, I believe, permits parties to waive or to exclude judicial review of the arbitral law, provided the parties are foreign and have no connection to Switzerland or Belgium. Well, the new French law goes one step further. It allows those waivers to be valid for both foreign and for French parties. A word because we talked about the, the, the arbitration clause, which is obviously the cornerstone of any arbitration. There are no substantive or formal requirements that render an arbitration agreement valid or enforceable in France. French law requires neither a written agreement or any other particular form, and the new law now makes this explicit. Um, Two, two more points, I think, that are worth stressing about the, the, the new arbitration law. One is the, the increased support role of French courts, which is provided for in that new law. French courts have been historically very reluctant to intervene or to interfere with the arbitral process, and they've been very um, cautious to make sure that they don't do that. Um, on the other hand, they've been very keen to support the arbitration process wherever they can. That has been enhanced, and there is a specific support judge the juge d'appui now, who will be the president of the Paris First Instance Tribunal, who can resolve any procedural dispute relating to arbitration proceedings seated in France, or to proceedings in respect of which the parties have chosen French procedural um, law. His role will obviously be more significant in adult <coughs> arbitrations that are not governed by institutions. But that support judge has already, during the last year, assisted with the appointment of tribunals and with deciding any challenge to arbitrators. Um, no French connection is necessary to get the assistance of that support judge. It's also available to foreign parties to an arbitration taking place outside of France in two instances. One is in order to avoid a denial of justice, and the other is when the parties have chosen to give jurisdiction to the French courts to resolve their arbitration-related disputes. So there's no need for any connection at all with France. A support judge is effectively being granted universal jurisdiction in cases where no other state court is ready or able to assist the arbitration proceedings. I can't leave um, talking about Paris as a place of arbitration with, with a mention of the principle of compétence compétence, something that was very early on um, subscribed to by the French law. The new decree codifies that principle and states that a court shall refuse to hear a dispute which is covered by an arbitration agreement unless the arbitral tribunal has not been seized in the um, of the dispute and the arbitral agreement is manifestly void or inapplicable. The tribunal is therefore given priority for deciding the validity or the existence of the arbitration agreement as well as the proper constitution of the tribunal. One further point is that the tribunal is given exclusive jurisdiction to rule on objections which relate to its jurisdiction. So under French law, they very much enshrine both, uh, enshrine both the positive and the negative effects of the principle of competence competence. One word as well about French judiciary, which has traditionally been extremely supportive of the arbitral um, process. And that's been assisted by the fact that there are specialised judges who deal exclusively and they are dedicated to arbitration, and that has been the case now for the last 20 years. And increasingly the case with this new support judge who will deal with all arbitration cases that come before the court. And it's to a large extent um, 
thanks to them and to their innovative decisions that um, arbitration in Paris is where it is today. Um, a few last words as well, without, um, without being too propagandist. Um, Log logistic advantages. Um, Paris is well connected. It's a modern capital city, two great airports, good um, railway network, hotels, um, fine for interpreters, fine for hearing centres. Um, great for a number of reasons. Um, you've had Freud being sold to you for Vienna as a place of arbitration, and um, Voltaire mentioned for um, Scotland even. And in France, all I need to say is Chateau Margaux. Um, what better way to do an arbitration than in the bottle? Um, one just final word as well, and that's just really the feedback from clients when I ask them about choosing Paris as a place of arbitration. These are clients who have other options as well. They, they handle arbitrations in Geneva, they handle some in London too. But I ask why for these particular disputes they chose Paris. One um, reason, and this was a number of clients, um, and first, um, an important reason was costs. Um, I don't know the statistics for the LCIA, so I'm not sure whether or not it, it's the case that for the larger disputes, the LCIA is cheaper than the ICC. But the real costs in these arbitrations are the costs of the council representing the parties. Hourly rates of lawyers in Paris are cheaper, significantly cheaper, in fact, we're just not expensive enough. That was a message I got from the clients. Um, compared with London, now I know that. I work at an international law firm. I know the rates that my colleagues in London charge. And I know that some of our um, global clients decide to come to Paris because we have more competitive rates. Um, those rates are kept more competitive as well because in Paris, the market is, I think, more competitive than the image that I have of the market in Paris, and that is done in London. And that is because we have a number of boutique law firms, excellent boutique law firms, and um, smaller law, uh, French law firms that are handling these disputes, who force the bigger firms to be competitive. They force us to have to do something for our clients if we want to keep the arbitration work coming in. Um, the other thing, and this reflects very much um, what Klaus said, and that was that they want a system where there's going to be minimal interference from the local courts, but maximum support when that's needed. And where they know that they will be able to get the support from lawyers. And in some ways, they said that when they come up and other firms that are likely, they get a one stop because they know that if they've got the law, they need to enforce it, they need to be challenged. That can all be done by an law firm that's based in Paris. I think that that the comments that I've got some of the questions.